Hello everyone, I am Bowser Jr. XD. In recent days, the sport of IndyCar has been under intense scrutiny, with a cesspool of bad TV ratings and a cheating scandal for the series' strongest team. One could say it's been pretty interesting, but in motorsports, interesting is the name of the game. Which brings us to the IndyCar Iceberg. You may recall a few years ago that I tried making Iceberg videos on NASCAR, only for me to stop after two episodes. I may or may not have gotten burned out. This time, however, I'm back and determined to make an Iceberg series for the long haul. And while NASCAR is definitely my biggest cup of tea, IndyCar, in my opinion, has the more interesting entries. So sit back and relax as we begin part one of an eight-part series on the ins and outs of IndyCar lore. The Indianapolis 500 is the crown jewel of the IndyCar series. Lasting for 200 laps on the 2.5 mile Indianapolis Motor Speedway, this event is one of the fastest around, with average speeds going over 200 miles per hour. Garnering hundreds of thousands of fans each year, this race is one of the most prestigious in the world. 257,327 seats represents the permanent seating capacity at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Like I said, Hundreds of thousands of people flock to this race every year. Incorporated on July 14, 1926, Speedway, Indiana is the town where IMS is located. You know you've got to be a big shot venue when you have an entire damn town named for you. The IMS road course is a 2.435 mile, 14 turn road course located inside of IMS. While the oval runs counterclockwise, the road course runs clockwise leading to parts of both layouts intersecting with each other, and the last three turns of the road course being in a chicane inside of Oval Turn 1. Formula 1 ran a modified version of the circuit from 2000 to 2007, and IndyCar has run the current configuration since 2014. NASCAR also tried running this from 2021 to 2023, but we don't talk about that. Gasoline Alley is the pit area for IndyCar teams as well as NASCAR Xfinity Series teams at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The garage is open for VIP fans, as I found out when I went to the Speedway in August, which allows for really good access and a really good fan experience. The IMS Museum is located near the center of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It contains all sorts of exhibits from Indy's past, including winning cars, old memorabilia, and even radical designs. It's definitely an interesting sight if you ever come to the Speedway. The IMS Radio Network, established in 1952, does the radio coverage for the Indy 500, other IndyCar races, and the Indy Next series. The lead commentator is Mark Jaynes, with former driver Davey Hamilton serving as driver analyst. In 1936, IndyCar legend Louis Meyer won his third Indy 500. To celebrate, he drank buttermilk in Victory Lane. Newspapers would report on it the next day, and since then, the winner of every Indy 500, except for 1993, has taken a drink of milk in Victory Lane, with the options of whole milk, 2% milk, and skim milk. The original Snake Pit was in the Turn 1 infield, which had a reputation for America's favorite pastimes, alcohol, fights, and nudity. When grandstands were added to that area during the 80s, the patrons would migrate to the Turn 4 infield, although they were much less rowdy. Eventually, they were forced to leave this area once that infield was bulldozed to make way for the road course. A new snake pit would emerge in 2010 in the Turn 3 infield, and to this day is used as a concert venue for Indy 500 race day. Although if you look hard enough into the crowd on race day, legend has it that you may find the same sins of Indy's past. Bump Day occurs on the last day of Indy 500 qualifying and determines who's in the field and who's not. In its current format, Day 1 of Indy 500 qualifying determines who starts in positions 13 through 30. On Day 2, the slowest drivers will run again to fill up the last row. The top 3 fastest make the race, all else go home. Bump Day has produced some of the most dramatic moments in IndyCar history, such as when Bobby Rahal, the 1992 champion, would fail to make the 1993 Indy 500. You'll find more stories from Bump Day in later videos. Is he in the 500 or is he out? Jack Harvey's in! Jack Harvey is in the Indy 500! Graham Rahal is out! 
the Pit Stop Challenge, introduced in 1977, is another indie tradition. In its modern form, a single match consists of two cars rolling into their pit stalls. The pit crew must then perform a four-tire pit stop along with a simulated refueling. The first team to finish pitting their car and then roll across the start-finish line wins. Matches are set up bracket style, with the last man standing winning the challenge. As of time of recording, the last winner, back in 2023, was Scott Dixon. The Borg Warner Trophy is the official winner's trophy of the Indianapolis 500. It was introduced in 1936 and contains the faces of every previous winner. The four-time club refers to drivers who have won the Indianapolis 500 four times. A.J. Foyt in 1961, 1964, 1967, and 1977, Al Unser in 1970, 1971, 1978, and 1987, Rick Mears in 1979, 1984, 1988, and 1991, and Elio Castroneves in 2001, 2002, 2009, and 2021. All four members of the four-time club have a bronze brick installed at Indianapolis. Welcome to the four-time club, Elio Castroneves! That is awesome! Two hundred forty one point four two eight miles per hour is the closed circuit speed record. It was set by Gilles de Ferrin for Team Penske at California Speedway in two thousand. Parker already suggested flat all the way around. First lap for Gilles de Ferrin two hundred and forty one point four two eight miles an hour that breaks mauricio guzman's record that breaks the close course record and that puts him on the pole what a surprise that is the aero screen is a safety feature attached to every indycar chassis since 2020. it consists of a ppg laminated polycarbonate windshield that starts on the nose and wraps around the cockpit while the aero screen is similar to that of the f1 halo as both protect from accidents such as airborne accidents or flips, the aero screen specifically defends from flying debris, stemming from the accident that killed Justin Wilson. The safer barrier is a defensive system that is attached to walls at a racetrack. The barrier itself consists of steel tubes and polystyrene. The combination allows cars that wreck into it to dissipate their kinetic energy, thus reducing the lethality of the wreck itself. They debuted at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 2002, and have been a mainstay at racetracks ever since. The 1982 Indy 500 was one of the most dramatic up to that point, and that comes down to the late race battle between Gordon Johncock and Rick Mears. On the final pit stop, Johncock took much less fuel, allowing him to gain several seconds on Mears and take the lead. However, Mears would have the much faster car, allowing him to dramatically close up on Johncock. The two would cross the finish line at the same time to take the white flag, and an intense last lap battle would ensue. John Cock would prevail over Mears by just 0.16 seconds, the closest ever finish in the 500 at that point. It is widely considered one of the greatest Indianapolis 500s. The 1992 Indy 500 is revered for similar reasons to the 1982 Indy 500. After race leader Michael Andretti retired from a dead engine, there were just seven laps to go to settle it between the top two drivers, Alan Sir Jr. and Scott Goodyear. The two would battle hard, and on the last lap, Unser would get loose in the final turns, giving Goodyear the opportunity to close up. Unser Jr. would barely eke out the victory over Goodyear by just 0 .043 seconds, which to this day is still the closest ever finish in the Indy 500. On the main stretch, Scott Goodyear closes in. He looks for a place to come by. Scott Goodyear tries it, but no! The 2006 Indy 500 is not only known for its amazing finish, but also for what could have been. When the race restarted with five laps to go, Michael Andretti led the field, but it was his 19-year-old son Marco that would take the lead on the next lap. Sam Hornish Jr., who had received a devastating penalty several laps prior, was able to use the caution to make his way back to the field and charge up to battle Marco. The two would battle hard over the next three laps, and on the final straightaway on the final lap, 
Sam Hornish Jr. would pull to the inside to win the Indy 500 by just .0635 seconds over Marco Andretti, making it the second closest finish in 500 history. It also marked the first time that a last lap pass had been made in the 500. Down the front stretch, it's a drag race! Marco Andretti, Hornish, who's gonna win at the stripe? It's Hornish! Oh, Hornish wins! Hornish wins. The 2011 Indy 500, set 100 years after the first Indy 500, had perhaps the most dramatic finish in the race's history. The race would come down to fuel mileage, with rookie J.R. Hildebrand taking the lead with two laps to go. While an upset victory seemed all but certain, coming off the final turn while trying to lap Charlie Kimball, Hildebrand would go wide and smack the front stretch wall. As Hildebrand's wrecked car would limp down the front straightaway, Second place Dan Weldon would cruise by and take the checkered flag for his second Indy 500 win. It was Dan Weldon's 16th and final victory before his passing at Las Vegas later that year. Dan Weldon is going to win the race! The 2013 Freedom 100 took place in IndyCar's lower series, which was then called Indy Lights. The Freedom 100 itself was a 40-lap race around Indianapolis, essentially as a prelude to the 500. In the waning laps, the battle for the win was between three drivers, Sage Karam, Gabby Chavez, and Carlos Munoz, with fourth-place driver Peter Dempsey trailing slightly behind. Coming off the final turn, Chavez, Munoz, and Karam were running three wide down the front stretch, slowing them just enough for Dempsey to catch up and make it a four-wide finish. Dempsey would win the race by just .0026 seconds, which at the time was the closest finish at the Speedway. While the Freedom 100 has not been run since 2019, the specific iteration still stands as one of the most spectacular finishes in Indy history. The 2008 Indy Japan 300, which took place at Twin Ring Motegi, was a landmark race in IndyCar history. The race was won by Danica Patrick, making this the first and so far only race to be won by a woman in IndyCar. Danica Patrick coming out of four, and boys, move over. The lady is coming through. Danica Patrick wins a twin ring, Motegi. The Triple Crown of IndyCar refers to a set of three 500-mile races in the course of a single season. From 1971 to 1980, it consisted of Indianapolis, Pocono, and Ontario. From 1981 to 1989, it consisted of Indianapolis, Pocono, and Michigan. In its last iteration, from 2013 to 2015, it consisted of Indianapolis, Pocono, and Fontana. Pulling double duty refers to running both the Indy 500 for IndyCar and the Coca-Cola 600 for NASCAR in the same day. John Andretti was the first to do it in 1994, and four other drivers have also done it. Davey Jones, Kirk Busch, Tony Stewart, twice, and Robbie Gordon, five times. This year, Kyle Larson will become the first driver in 10 years to pull double duty, running the Indy 500 for McLaren and the Coca-Cola 600 for Hendrick. The road to Indy is the ladder of series that lead up to IndyCar. At the bottom is USF Juniors, followed by USF 2000, then USF Pro 2000, and then Indy Next, with the final step being IndyCar itself. The Firehawk is the official mascot of Firestone, the official tire supplier for IndyCar, and he can be found at every single race. In 2020, after a cost cap was instituted for Formula One starting 2021, Ferrari said it was considering diverting some of its staff for efforts in the World Endurance Championship, or even IndyCar, most likely as an engine supplier. However, while the World Endurance Championship effort would materialize in 2023, the IndyCar effort never did. During the pandemic, IndyCar hosted several iRacing events, with the final one being a 70-lap race at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Formula One driver Lando Norris was leading with three laps to go, but coming off of Turn 4, he would slam into Simon Pagano, causing both to crash. Scott McLaughlin would win the race, but the focus would be on the late race contact between Pagano and Norris, with some suspecting that Pagano had gotten in Norris's way on purpose to prevent a Formula One driver from winning an IndyCar race. In 2021, IndyCar announced a new collaboration with Motorsport Games on an IndyCar video game. As a consequence to this, 
Penske Entertainment shuttered IndyCar's relationship with iRacing, causing IndyCar to be removed from the platform. However, after the deal with Motorsport Games was terminated, IndyCar would return to the iRacing platform in 2024. Going back to Motorsport Games, the company had already promised to make an IndyCar video game. However, they were already off to a bad start, with the company having already made several bad NASCAR games. The project was hampered by numerous delays and the company's financial struggles. Eventually, the situation would become too much to handle, and IndyCar would terminate the relationship in 2023. Coda would join the IndyCar schedule as a one-off in 2019. And what exactly were the track limits? Yeah, speaks for itself. It's well known that the drivers will prank each other in the lead-up to the Indy 500. Some of the more recent pranks include Roman Grosjean's scooter being relocated to the top of the Pagoda, or Marco Andretti buying James Hinchcliffe a crappy rental car, specifically a 1997 right-side drive Nissan March. WTF Moments in IndyCar is a playlist of videos made by the YouTuber Frisky Nixon. It consists of compilations of strange crashes, weird occurrences, and quirky off-track moments across IndyCar history. The Beginner's Guide to Oval Racing is a Twitter thread made by user Cassie, aka at Mama GeForce, to show IndyCar newbies the ins and outs of oval racing. If you're unfamiliar with ovals, I definitely recommend checking it out. The Classic Races list can be found on a page on the IndyCar Reddit under the tab New to IndyCar in the Newbie Guide. The list has races ranging from 1975 to 2019, because this page hasn't been edited since then to include 2020's races. Certain must-watch races, such as the 2015 Fontana race, are bolded, and I definitely recommend giving those a watch. Fast and Left speaks for itself. I started drinking at 6 a.m. and we're here now, I don't know what time it is, but I'm rolling deep and those cars are going real fast and real left, son. They're going fast and left. Fuck yeah! <laughs> the Vanderbilt Cup was the first major trophy in auto racing. Created by William Vanderbilt II and used for three races in Nassau County, New York. The trophy was reused for races in the 1910s, and then again for a few races in the 1960s, but its major relation to IndyCar came with the CART IRL split. From 1996 to 1999, the trophy was revived as the trophy for the US 500. After the US 500 was shuttered, it became the championship trophy for CART and Champ Car from 2000 to 2007. The USAC CART split began in 1978. USAC had sanctioned American open wheel racing from 1956 to 1978, but teams were unhappy with USAC's management, especially with races outside the Indy 500. As a result, the top teams would break off and form CART, aka Championship Auto Racing Teams. CART had snagged most of the big teams, save for Foyt, as well as most of the big tracks, thus allowing it to dominate the scene. By 1984, the only major open-wheel race that USAC sanctioned was the Indy 500, effectively giving CART near-total control over the American open-wheel scene. That is, until the next entry. The CART vs. IRL debacle started in 1995, when Tony George, the owner of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, created the Indy Racing League as a response to CART. While CART was more road course-centric and featured a more international lineup of drivers, the Indy Racing League was all ovals and had more American drivers. While CART started out much stronger, at the turn of the century, the Indy Racing League began to equal and then surpass CART's popularity, especially as big teams left CART to join the IRL from 2002 to 2003. In 2007, the IRL, now named IndyCar, and CART, now named ChampCar, would merge back into one series, unifying open wheel racing in America. In 1996, during the first season of the split, CART had designed an event to compete with the Indy 500, taking place on the same day at the same time. This would be the US 500, 
a 500-mile race at Michigan International Speedway, one of the most popular ovals on the calendar. The event would infamously get off to a bad start, as a third of the field crashed before they even took the green flag. In 1997, the race was moved from late May to late July, and in 1998, the Hanford device was added to the cars, resulting in a record-breaking 62 lead changes across 250 laps. While the racing was great, the name didn't stick, and the US 500 moniker was dropped after 1999. The Holman family owned the Indianapolis Motor Speedway from 1945 to 2019, starting when family patriarch Tony Holman bought the Indianapolis Motor Speedway from Eddie Rickenbacker. The two most prominent members of the family were Mary Holman George and Tony George. Mary Holman George was the chairperson for the board of directors for IMS and Holman and Company from 1988 to 2016, and she also gave the starting command for the Indy 500 from 1997 to 2015. Tony George, on the other hand, is much more well known, having served as the CEO of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway from 1989 to 2009. Some of the important events that happened under his leadership include the running of the Brickyard 400 for NASCAR, as well as the creation of the Indy Racing League. The Holman family would sell the Speedway in 2019 to our final entry of the day. Roger Penske is the owner of Team Penske. Roger Penske is the owner of Team Penske, the most dominant team in series history. In 2019, he purchased not just the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, but IndyCar itself. While the purchase was initially praised, in recent years, Penske has come under fire for his decision making. This includes problems such as a stagnant schedule with too many road courses, the hybrid engines being delayed, and one of the two engine manufacturers potentially bowing out of the sport. Well, that does it for episode one. We covered the basics and scratched the surface, but come episode two, we'll begin our descent into the deep. I hope you enjoyed the video, and until next time, this is Bowser Jr. XD, signing off. Have a good one.